Welcome back to ECE 320A. We're in unit 11, which is our active filter design unit, and 11 homework in unit 11 is due at the end of this unit, and the final exam is at the end of the next unit. What we want to do in this video is actually understand how to select the capacitor values, and there are just two of those capacitors, C1 and C2, in a second order filter section to realize or achieve a quadratic representation. And that quadratic representation, you can recall from table 15.1, if you examine this table, you will see that Either you're dealing with an odd filter order, n equal 1, 3, 5, or you're dealing with an even filter order, n equal 2, n equal 4, n equal 6. If you're dealing with odds, then you're always going to have this S plus 1 factor as a term in your denominator polynomial. If you're dealing with the evens, then you will not have that S plus 1 factor, and you'll have different versions of quadratic factors. Look at this for n equal 2. You can see that we have a square root of 2 scaling the linear term. When we had a third order, we actually have a 1 in terms of in the coefficient of that linear term. If we get down to the fourth, then we have two quadratic factors, and actually those quadratic factors are different in terms of they have to achieve different roots because we're dealing with this Butterworth pole pattern that we looked at in the last video. So what we want to do in this video is determine how do we select C1 and C2 to either obtain a square root of 2 here, a 1 here, or a 0.765. We need to understand how to produce these quadratic factors with the appropriate coefficient in that linear term. And that's what we will be doing in this video. So we're dealing with a second order, and here is the circuit, an op-amp circuit, that we will use to realize that second order section. And we want to now select C1 and C2 to achieve Butterworth patterns in these quadratic factors. And the Butterworth filters, the reason, remember, that we're doing this is because they achieve this monotonic behavior in the passband and the stop band. And in the passband, the magnitude response is very flat. And it's flat until the very last moment in frequency, and then it bends down and passes through minus 3 dB right at the cutoff. It doesn't continually, gradually flow. It actually is sharp <clears throat> or flat until we get just about to the 3 dB point or the break frequency, and then it goes through that minus 3 dB point at the right location in frequency. So what we want to do now is determine how do we select C1 and C2 for capacitor values in order to obtain a the, the correct coefficients in these quadratic factors. And you can see that we have to pick different C1s and C2s depending on which of those quadratic factors this second order section is implementing or realizing. So here is our second order section and the transfer function that we will derive will keep C1 and C2 as variables but we go ahead and just let R, the resistor values, be set equal to 1. And I think it's a good exercise for you to now try to find the transfer function between V sub I, the input, and V sub O, the output. And again, this is coming to us in Chapter 15, Figure 21. And you can see that I've already helped you in that process of determining the transfer function between V sub i and V sub 0. I've identified two nodes, 
node 1, and I've labeled that voltage at that node capital V sub 1, and node 2, can you determine what that needs to be in terms of a label? You could label it V sub 2 across C sub 2, but you can also hopefully start to see that, oh, if we go back here and realize that we now have a negative feedback, that now forces this virtual short across those two terminals. And in fact, this node at node 2 has a voltage that is V sub 0. So we only really have three voltages to worry about, V sub i, V sub 1, and V sub 0. We can now write two KCL equations, one at node 1 and one at node 2, and they should give you this particular transfer function. When you solve or eliminate V sub 1 among those two equations. So here's what I'm suggesting will lead to that transfer function. You can write a KCL equation at node 1, and you really just have the three currents. You have this current, that current, and that current to deal with. And then at node 2, hopefully you see the currents there. In, at node 2, you have this current, which is what? Well, we're assuming an ideal op amp, and so there's no current going into either the non-inverting or the inverting terminal. We have this current, and we have that current. If you can now sum those currents, leaving those two nodes, and set them equal to zero, you will find two equations, eliminate the V1, between those two equations, and you should end up with this transfer function. And now, remember, we've set the R's to 1, and the C's we've left undetermined, or yet to be determined. And what we want to do is now calculate C1 and C2 by really just comparing coefficients in this transfer function with the appropriate coefficient from table 15.1. And the appropriate coefficients will depend on whether you're designing a second order filter, a third order filter, a fourth order filter. Table 15.1, you can see that those different quadratic factors dealing with n equal 2 or n equal 5, those linear coefficients differ depending on the order of your Butterworth filter. That being said, let's do that. And let's go ahead and do that for this particular video. Let's just compare C1 and C2 in this expression with this generic structure, this normalized quadratic factor. It's normalized to 1. All of those have been normalized in table 15.1, so we need to force that constant coefficient to equal 1 by the choice of C1 and C2, and then we need to pick B sub 1 in terms of C sub 1 and C sub 2. So if we do that, let's look at the constant terms. We have two constant terms, and they're actually the same formula in this transfer function, and they both need to be set equal to 1. We just want a 1 over a quadratic, and we want to normalize the constant coefficient in the denominator to equal 1. So by comparing coefficients, we can see then that we need for 1 over C1, C2, that's what I highlighted in yellow, to be consistent with this expression, we need that particular coefficient to equal 1. And in fact, we'll see that in a minute, well, let's just say that is what we have, and we'll come back to that implied arrow in just a minute. Now let's look at the linear term. The linear term is this B1 
in our normalized quadratic factor, and B1 could be many different values as you found or can see in table 15.1. That now needs to be equal to this coefficient in our derived second order transfer function. We then need B sub 1 to equal 2 over C sub 1. And if we're starting with table 15.1, we know what B sub 1 is, so that means that we need to select C sub 1 to be equal to 2 over B sub 1. And once we have C sub 1, we can now use that here to solve for C sub 2. Now we know that C sub 2, in terms of C sub 1, they basically have to form a value of 1 in order to 1 over C1, C2 to be equal to 1. So we're really saying now that C sub 2 can be found once we have C sub 1. And C sub 2 will be 1 over C sub 1. So let's go ahead and look at what that looks like for a particular second order Butterworth pattern. So let's now find C sub 1 and C sub 2 for a second order filter, which means that we're now dealing with this particular factor in table 15.1, and we now know that B sub 1 is this square root of 2. If B sub 1 is now the square root of 2 from table 15.1, we're just using that as an example, then we apply the formulas for C sub 1 and C sub 2. B1 being 2 over C sub 1 says that C sub 1 is 2 over B sub 1. B sub 1, we just found it from table 15.1 for a second order filter is the square root of 2. So now we know that C sub 1 is 2 over the square root of 2 or the square root of 2, which is 1.414. Once we found C sub 1, we know from this comparing of coefficients that C sub 2 is the reciprocal of C sub 1. So now C sub 2 is 1 over the square root of 2, and that's 0 0.707. And that's really all there is to selecting these values for C sub 1 and C sub 2 associated with these second order filters or second order sections. So depending on what order we want to achieve, then we put, we cascade these second order and first order sections together in order to achieve the necessary filter order. So we need to be able to combine first order sections of filters, and that we've already done in video four of this unit, and we need to combine those. If we had a third order filter, then we would need one first order section and one second order section, and we just learned how to select those coefficients in a second order section to obtain a denominator that's the product of the first order section s plus 1 and this second order section s squared plus s plus 1 except now we would need to set c1 equal to something a little different now b1 is 1 so now if b1 is 1 then c1 is 2 and c sub 2 is the reciprocal of that or 1 half and that's what we would need if we were designing a third order filter and we would need from video 11.4 the op-amp configuration for a first order factor, and there the, C's are, the C is 1 and the R's are 1. All of those combine then to give us the strategy for designing Butterworth filters. We simply figure out what order we need, and that's going to be the next video, and then we have to determine what quadratic factors 
and the linear factor. We only have the one linear factor depending on if we're dealing with an odd filter order.